Morning. You guys keep scooting further back, it seems. Maybe I should set up there. <clears throat> well, today's my last Sunday with you all. Um, and I want to thank you for allowing me to be here these last, these last three weeks. Um, I'm excited for you all that you have uh, an interim pastor that you've hired. I know how important that is um, when you're going through times of liminality or transition. And so I'm excited for you for that. The other great thing about that is, since I'm not coming back, I can kind of say whatever I want, and there's nothing you guys can really do about it. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. Um, really, the, what, I'm, what I want to do today is um, to, to try to teach the book of Jonah in three weeks is really, is really too short. Um, so I kind of was, was left with one of two options, and that was to either teach the text like I have done the last two weeks, or hopefully I've given you enough about the text that you could kind of come up to your own conclusions. We're still going to read chapter four and we'll, we'll do a little commentary on it. But what we said from the very beginning is that we're teaching the book of Jonah through the lens of parable, which is what I believe it is. Um, and what a parable does, as, as we talked about in the last couple of weeks, is it's layered with meanings. It's why today we can read Jesus's parables and we can still get meaning upon meaning upon meaning upon meaning. And so what I, what I want to do is... Um, is simply go through, go, yeah, go through three to four take, takeaways, thoughts, ideas um, that, I, that I think the book of Jonah leaves us with. And it does. If you, if you read the book of Jonah, and we'll see it at the end of chapter four, it just kind of leaves us hanging. It's, it's, it's a weird ending. In fact, chapter four is almost what some, some commentators have called like a, a dark comedy a little bit. Um, and it just kind of leaves us especially if you're the original audience, a little bit, a little bit un, unsettled. Um, but, it is, but it's a parable, so it also leaves us with some thoughts to, to take away. And you might later on read the book of Jonah and come up with five or six thoughts, and that's, but that's the purpose of the parable. That's, that's what's great about Scripture being a living and breathing text. It doesn't stay stuck in the past. It continually is reviving and telling us new stories with the old traditional stories. You with me? All right, so here's what we're going to do. We are going to read the text. We're going to read chapter four together. I'll stop here and there to kind of, maybe, to explain some things that might have been lost in translation. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and summarize together the entire book. And then I'm going to go, th like I said, through three or four takeaways. Um, and so hopefully my gift to you today is that this will be a shorter sermon than, than the last few weeks, last couple of weeks have been. Um, so let's pray and let's get to work. Um, Father, we thank you that, that your word, that scripture has, has survived times and that, that it and changes and that it never really becomes irrelevant, but it always speaks to us right where we're at in the midst of change and in in our highs and our lows. And so I ask you today as we, we finish the story of Jonah um, that you would, you would plant seeds in in our minds and in our hearts that would allow us to begin to see what you're doing in the world differently that would be a reminder of our vocation and that would be a reminder of your greatness. We love you and we glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. Actually, before we read the text, let's go ahead and summarize what we've done so far, okay? And so remember, I know this, this crowd specifically is really quiet Choir, not so much. So if, remember last week. So um, if I kind of pause or ask a question, it's typically not rhetorical, right? Which means you can answer. In church, you can talk. It's okay. Okay, so the book of Jonah starts out with a prophet name. You guys are good. Thanks. See, they, that was like, that was the setup. That was an easy one, and we didn't get that. Okay, it starts up with a prophet named Jonah, and he is a prophet. We're going to mix some. We're going to mix some of the history we've talked about. He's a prophet to who? Northern Kingdom. They're good. They listen to the Northern Kingdom because Israel has been split into two, right? And and at the time of the story, not to who who the book was delivered, but at the time of Jonah. Um, the northern kingdom, they were experiencing financial prosperity, military might, and so on and so on. 
And the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and God tells Jonah, the prophet to the northern kingdom, to go where? Nineveh. I think it's like getting A pluses back here. Uh, to go to Nineveh, but, but Jonah doesn't want to do that. Um, Jonah, he, he runs from God, right? Runs from God, which let us know that already the northern kingdom and their prophets had reduced the idea of God to a national deity, which created the sin of nationalism. Their nation is better than other nations. We've never heard that before, have we? And so Jonah, he goes to a boat and he takes off to Tarshish. Yeah, good. That was good. Spain. Um, I didn't see that one coming. Uh, so he takes off to Tarshish um, and because he thinks he's running from the, the presence of God. And he is on a ship or boat uh, with, with pagans and a storm comes up, right? And uh, the pagans, they don't know what's going on, but they're freaked out and they're scared and they start unloading the boat. And the, but the storm gets, right? The storm has been personified. Remember, we kind of talked about that a little bit. It starts getting even more wild. And so they run down to Jonah and what's going on? And Jonah finally, he confesses. He says, I've been running from God. And the only thing, way out of this is for you to toss me over. They don't really want to do that. They don't want their, his blood on their hands, but they kind of figured this is we got to do this. This is what this guy's saying. And it's apparently this guy's God that's doing this. And so they toss him over, but the pagans also do something else. Anybody remember what they do? A little more of a trick question. They repent. They repent to this, what would have been a foreign God to them. Jonah's thrown into the water and then uh, the beast, the sea creature swallows Jonah up. And we have in chapter two, this long uh, psalm, the psalm of Jonah is really what it is. And he is, he is repenting and he's making all of these promises, which look like by the time we get to the end of the book, which look like empty promises to God. And so the, the beast gets indigestion and spits Jonah back up. And then remember last week we said what's interesting about the Jewish narratives is instead of typically in the way they told the narratives, instead of going beginning, middle, end, they go beginning, middle, new beginning. And so unlike, from what I understand, unlike any other book um, in, the, in the Old Testament, the most original text we have has a gap between chapter two and what we call uh, chapter three. Now they, would, they didn't have chapters and verses then, but there's a gap and that gap was intentional. That gap represented we're starting over. This is the gospel area. I'm not finished with you yet is what God is telling to the Jews. I'm not finished with you. We're going to do this again. So Jonah's, Jonah's not spit back up on Nineveh and then he gets up covered in, you know, seaweed and, and does his thing. He's, the picture we're supposed to get is he's back in, he's back in the northern kingdom kind of doing his deal. And God says, all right, we're going to do this again. And he calls Jonah. And what does Jonah do this time? He goes, do y'all like sit in the front of the row in school, like in the front of the class? Yeah, he goes, he goes to, he goes to Nineveh this time. And um, he starts to preach this message of repentance calling these pagan people to repentance. We talked about who Nineveh was, right? They, they were the seed, the seat of the most oppressive empire that the Jews had uh, ever set under, right? And up to this point, probably that had been, been on earth. Um, so any like atrocity you can think of today that was just, I can't believe God could ever forgive that. We got to put the weight to it that it is. We can apply this to the Ninevites. So Jonah goes through, um, but what we see is we see kind of a Jonah who's not interested. He says it's a three-day walk. And do you guys remember how long he actually walks? One day. He goes to one day. He's not even going to go halfway through the city. And he starts to just kind of tell the story. And you have this kind of almost this organic movement. The, the story is told from Jonah. It's picked up from the people of Nineveh. And, it's, and then it... It's preached to the king, probably from the Ninevites. And what's the king's reaction? Come on, y'all. He repents, thanks. He repents, right? But, but what we saw last week is the repentance is not just a confessional. It's not just a, I'm sorry, but everything changes. 
right? He begins to, like, he stops everything. We showed how the, the text even brings out he stops all commerce. He stops all economic development. He stops basically all of their systems so that they can begin to look at how the systems that have caused them to benefit are oppressing other people. And he calls the people to it. And then God, it says he relents. He, he, the actual phrase for it, which is, I think, quite fascinating, the actual Hebrew phrase is, is not that God relents, but that God repented of evil. That's, we could spend a long time on that, but we won't. Okay, and so then, well, now we're here at chapter four. So let's, let's do this. So chapter four. But this was very displeasing to Jonah. What was very displeasing to Jonah? That they were spared, that they had the option, right? This was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is, that is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. So this is the first time we get information as to why Jonah was running from God in the first place. It's oftentimes assumed he was afraid of Nineveh, which would, which would make sense. But the truth is, something about him knew that God was going to show grace and favor to these pagans that he believed did not deserve the grace of God, which is a weird phrase to use because the deserve and grace should never be used together. But this is where his mindset was. He is angry at God, right? But not just mad. Let's see how far he takes it. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. I can't live in a world in which people like that can be forgiven. I can't live in a world in which people who have oppressed my people can be shown grace. So if you're going to give them grace, take my life. It's pretty drastic, yeah? Can we agree on that? All right, maybe, maybe not. And now, oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. He's still hoping. Still hoping. Maybe it'll be destroyed. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from the discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. He's like got the emotional capacity of a preschooler. No offense to preschoolers. He's like ready to kill himself because God showed mercy and now he's like beside himself with happiness because of a plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. So we've gone full circle, right back, ready to die again. Nineveh must have been like Texas. It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor in which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city, we talked about the word great last week, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left hand and also many animals. That's like my favorite ending, I think, of any book, that last sentence, and also many animals animals like God is very concerned about the animals in this book have you noticed that remember how we talked about that last week um okay so here's what I want to do I want to instead of kind of go teach the text again I just kind of want to go through uh some of the takeaways of what I think this parable is trying to get across and if you like I said if you you know you've got six or seven that's fantastic 
Um, but these are, the, these are the three or four that really, that really stood out to me. Um, if, let me give you an example to start this. So, so I know Rich, I'm using Rich as an example. We, we kind of know each other. We know each other from the brewery and a little bit here. And if Rich were to go out into Gelsberg and show people memes, anybody else know that part of Rich? No, okay, tell people about me about what his interpretation of me based off of the way he has encountered me at the brewery. And based off of Rich's interpretation of me, people decided, and I don't think this would happen, but people decided, yeah, I don't, I don't think I like that Matthew dude. I don't think I like him. And they listed various reasons why they didn't like me. Would it be me they weren't liking? It's not a trick question. No, it would be Rich's interpretation of me. Right? Because they don't, they don't know me. They've not spent time with me. But they just, all they know of me is what, what Rich has said. We live in a world today in which, whether it's leading philosophers or that are atheists or leading atheists or people who don't know what to do, with the God of this Bible have decided they don't like God because, does anybody know why they don't like God? Because what? What people have said about him and what they've said about him is how could you serve a God who is so vengeful? How could you serve a God who according to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges has commanded the genocide, if we can just use the word, of people. We could never serve a God like that. And yet, by the time we get to the book of Jonah, what is the reason Jonah's ready to denounce God? Because his offensive goodness, he's ready to turn away from God because of God's grace, his mercy, and his goodness that sees no limit is what offends Jonah. We have a Jesus who is the son of and serves the God who would be an awful national security advisor who says when the enemy strikes what do you do you turn the other cheek anybody can love their friends but you are to love your enemy this is not a vengeful God this is not a God that commands genocide this is a God that is abounding in so much grace so much goodness that it offends those of us who have bought into systems of justice that say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I know, then we say, well, if Scripture is real and true, then what do we do with these stories of a God who says to destroy the Canaanites, wipe them out, women, children, the whole deal, What's, what's interesting is we do have that command in Scripture, but by the time you get to, to David and Solomon, the Canaanites are still around. I think, I think what we have, I think what Scripture is showing us more than anything is how God steps into our understanding of this deity and begins to work with us right where we are. And what we have in our scriptures is an understand it starts off with a people who understood deity as a being as a thing as an energy that would command human sacrifice that won its popularity through violence but God loved the people so much that he stepped into that knowing their understanding was so off was so wrong And he begins to walk with them through time 
until we get to the story of Jonah and we see a God who is trying to tell people, this is not who I really was, this is who you thought I was. What you need to watch out for is that my grace and my goodness can be so offensive that it might cause you to misunderstand what I'm really about. Which takes me to the next one. So the the first takeaway for me is the offensive goodness of God. God, through the book of Jonah, is trying to say, I'm not this God of wrath and vengeance and genocide. I'm a God whose goodness reaches far beyond your imagination. The next one would be, that would, that would have stood out to the original audience is what I will call witness of the rest or witness by the rest. One of the things that God's people, whether you start from early Israel or, or, or all the way down here at the church, is we've had a problem with thinking much of ourselves. We're thinking that if God wants the world to know anything, they have to know it through us. Remember, we, t- we talked about that, how that the inclusion of God's people was not for the exclusion of the rest of the world, but for their inclusion also. The truth is, God is much bigger than the boxes that our religion has kept him in. Right? God is working in the world. So we, we've, like here, here's a missionary phrase that, that we used to use, is that we're going to take God to another land. We can't take God to another land. God's already there. And he invites us to play. He invites us to be part of what he is already doing. And sometimes one of the most humbling things for God's people is to set back and recognize that God is already at work in the world without us. Sometimes God is witnessing to the church through the world. Sometimes we need to step back and watch the way God is teaching things like justice and mercy, acceptance through the world to us and let that be an example to us. This would have stood out maybe more than any of it. You had a pagan crew that repents You have an oppressive pagan king who begins to disassemble his economic system because of the oppression that it was causing. God is using the pagans, I don't like that word, but that's kind of how they define it. He's using the pagans as a witness to his people. This is God's call to humility. You with me? Yeah? So we have the offensive, nature, the offensive goodness of God, the witness of the rest. And then last week, do you remember the term we used, universal salvation? Those of you who are here, do you remember that? And, and part of that, to understand that, we had to redefine salvation, right? Salvation was, was never supposed to be about this thing that happens when you die that you go to a new geographical location in the sky, right? Scripture is very vague on that. It's funny how vague Scripture is about that kind of stuff, and we've created these whole doctrines on. But universal salvation had to do with God's vision for universal shalom, peace, well-being, the working together of all things for the well-being of all things, for all of creation. The last line in this book, and also the animals, Let's us know that God is interested in something far greater and far bigger than you and I getting to some place called heaven. But God is interested in partnering with a people for the good of all creation, including the animals, the systems, the structures, the ecosystems in which his kingdom can be expressed. And oftentimes in the way we've boxed God in, we reduce God's plan of salvation to something it was never meant to be and God has something that is much bigger in mind. And his invitation to Israel, to us, is to allow us to be part of it. To 
allow us to expand this message of goodness and grace. And then the, and then the final one, the final one is this. And this is the one we don't really like. But it's everything has a lifespan. Everything has a lifespan. I think symbolic, and I think the Jews would have, would have gotten this, is the plant that grew up to cover him that he found rest under. It's symbolic. Remember, do you remember the three things that we said God had gifted the Jews with? Not as an end, but as a means to an end. Do anybody remember what those three are? What? Temple? Anybody else? I got all day. Land and the Davidic king. Those were never supposed to be their identity. They were supposed to be means to help shape their identity as a people to bless the rest of the world. And because those three things were easier to manage, they turned the very things that were supposed to be a means into the end. And it made a very destructive people. We do that. We do that with our denominational titles. We do that with our doctrines. We do that with the way we structure worship services. We do that with the people that we have decided are out versus those who are in. We do that as people. But those things used to, just like the land, the temple, and the Davidic king, they, they served a purpose. But their purpose had a lifespan. When they quit serving their purpose, God no longer needed them. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus will be talking to the Pharisees and he will, he will brag on them for their ability to tithe. He will brag on them for their worship services. He will brag on them for keeping the law. And then he will say, but all of those existed for one reason and one reason only. And that was to create a people of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And if they're no longer doing that, they're not needed. The truth is, depending on where you fall on this issue, if you fall in the camp of the Big Bang, no matter your vantage point, from that point of singularity, the universe has been moving forward, not back. It's never been about moving back. The Jews were the first people that we know of who thought of time in a linear fashion. In other words, time was going somewhere. It was moving forward. God is not calling us back to a place. God is ahead of us, pulling us forward. And that means some of the systems and the structures, we see it happening now. We see it happening in our country. We see it happening in the church world. The church isn't dying, but our systems and structures are. And sometimes we just need to let go of those. The way we have boxed God in, they served a purpose at one time. But sometimes God comes along and he breaks those and he says, I'm moving you, I'm pulling you forward into my future to be part of my work in this new world. This is what I think the story of Jonah is about. I think it's an invitation into a new tomorrow to remember the traditions of the past and say they were good, but God is doing something new that none of us have even dreamed of. And it will at some times, because it's so good and so gracious, it will offend us because of the boxes we have put God in. But like between Jonah 2 and 3, he's willing to start over and over and over to allow us to be a part. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this book. We thank you for, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you that you continually are willing to slow down and pull us towards you when we want to hang out in the past. We thank you that you are continually doing what seems to us to be a new thing because you want to include all of creation. We repent of the times in which we become so exclusive. We repent of the times that our definition of your goodness for some reason includes the exclusion of others. We ask you to open our hearts and our minds 
to remember that you are a God of goodness for all of creation and that you have invited us to be part of that. In your name we pray, amen.